Good afternoon, everyone. I know uh, after lunch presentations usually are a little bit sluggish. Um, so welcome to I Make Them Good Processes Go Bad. Uh, I was going to play the audio, uh, you know, I make them good. Yeah, no, I'm not going to sing it. Um, might mess with YouTube filters and stuff. So we're going to deep dive on wall bins and GTFO bins. Um, really quick, who here knows what a CYB, CYA slide is, what that stands for? Okay, um, if you don't know what it is, it's just legal disclaimer stuff. I have to say it because I don't want you guys to think that this is any of the positions of my current or former employers. This is all me. Um, this is all my personal opinion. I want to tell you guys, just like when it comes to hacking, don't attempt anything in this presentation without prior authorization, especially when it comes to systems you might not own. Um, make sure you vet everything with the proper legal, HR, management, blah, blah, blah. Um, keep your ethics high and don't become what you are defending against. Um, I always like to include a synopsis slide. Uh, just in case people have an idea of what this presentation is about and then it really winds up not being it. I don't know how many of you guys are fans of The Office when Pam winds up in the wrong class and the teacher's just like, nah, sit down. So that's kind of what I um, include this slide for is, a, you know, okay, I'm in the wrong presentation. Well, you guys have time to leave now. So we're going to talk about wall bins, GTFO bins, and wall bins. Does anybody know what an L-O-O-L bin is? Yeah, this one's pretty new, but we're going to be talking about that. So a little bit of the history of them. Um, I like to include uh, explain like I'm five because I understand that there's going to be different levels of experience with this stuff. So I always start off with like an explain like I'm five and then we move on from that. Um, attacker and defender perspective, anything that's commonly abused, and then some real world examples and some wrap ups. So a little bit about me. I'm an advanced threat hunter. If you really want to know where, you can look me up on LinkedIn, but I don't like to like advertise it because it's really easy to find out where I work, and I like to present as a subject matter expert. It just makes things a little bit easier for me from like a legal compliance standpoint stuff. I also do a lot of research on the side. Um, if you guys meet up with my boyfriend, he's here. He has to drag me away from the computer sometimes because I spend way too much time on it, but I like to do a lot of research. and. Because of that research, you guys are going to see a wall bin that has not been disclosed to the wall bins project today. Um, about a server of 300 people on Discord know about it, so you guys are getting a sneak peek about that, um, thanks to research. I have some certifications, you know, like the CISSP, Azure Fundamentals, whatever. Um, I am in the top 1% of Try Hack Me, and I'm currently on a 600 day streak. And if anybody knows how to break streaks, please help me because I don't know how to break this without feeling terrible about myself. Um, but yeah, so I'm a member of InfraGuard. I'm also on the Technology Advisory Board of Grand Island. I like to box. I box out of Cassells in Niagara Falls. Uh, if you guys want to actually try like an old school boxing routine, come check me out at Cassells. Um, I recently did earn my black belt out of there in kickboxing too, so don't, don't mess with the nerd. Uh, and then I also do a lot of rocking. Um, I'm like a corporate liaison for the KIA Memorial March, which is a local charity here that helps veterans in need when it comes to like, you know, food or assistance and stuff like that. So we're getting on to why you're actually here. So who knows what a wall bin is? Uh, living off the land binary. Yep. Do you know what it does? Or it's a command uh, that already exists. Generally, you're just talking about a Windows system uh, that can be used for badness. Yep, exactly. So the actual definition are executables that are part of an operating system that can be exploited for an attack. Um, in my opinion, anything could be a wall bin, GTFO bin, wall bin, if you try hard enough, probably, which is what I'm finding with my research anyways. So there are a number of different projects that actually track this stuff, and we will go through this stuff, and my pointer actually is showing up a little bit. Um, so wall bins, again, it's Windows, and yep, that stands for living off the land binaries, like you explained. Uh, GTFO bins, I was always like kind of concerned on how to like approach this one, because I'm sure everybody knows what GTFO stands for, and how do I actually say it in a presentation? So we're just gonna go with GTFO bins, and those are Linux binaries. And then 
Lol bins stands for living off the orchard binaries, and that's a brand new project that involves Mac OS. And I've seen quite a few Mac devices around here. Um, so this is a good one to get to know, and I'll be showing you the website in a little bit. So before we get really rolling in it, there's a history behind it. So living off the land actually came from a presentation at DerbyCon. Did anybody have like the opportunity to go to DerbyCon before it closed? I'm really jealous. DerbyCon was uh, run by Trusted Tech. So living off the land first kind of appeared in 2013. Uh, Christopher Campbell and Matthew Graber at DerbyCon 3.0. They were talking about pen testing though. So they were talking about as a pen tester, how do we get away with some of our attacks? And that's where living off the land actually started to churn the masses, I guess. But for years, there were so many different names to it. Um, my favorite name is misplaced trust binaries. So that's what people were uh, calling these wall bins before they were wall bins. So surrogate programs, proxy binaries, all that sort of stuff. And then as always, Somebody on Twitter, which InfoSec Twitter, if you guys aren't a part of, I'm not going to get into the politics of Twitter. I have a Mastodon. I have a Lurker Twitter. It's where I find my information. So somebody at a point was just like, hey, can we just come up with a name for these things so we're not all calling it something different? And so the best way to do that was a Twitter poll. Uh, so with 40, no, 34%, everybody decided on surrogate binaries. but as Twitter happens, that didn't stick because somebody was like, hey, I propose living off the land binaries because I like that name. And then Advar Mo, who had heard that from Philip Goh, was like, hey, why don't we do living off the land binaries instead of surrogate binaries? And if you don't know Advar Mo, he is, uh, currently works for Trusted Sec, I do believe. Um, he is kind of the founder of the project, more or less. So he proposed that idea and in Twitter cybersecurity fashion, there was another poll. And so this poll eventually put it to rest. There was 49 votes and a nice percentage and history was made. And unlike many cybersecurity professionals who go, hey, this is a really good idea, he actually picked it up. You know, how many times have you guys in your company go, hey, we should do this and then nobody implements it because nobody wants to take on the work. So kudos to Avramo. Um, he ran the final poll. He spread Walbins far and wide, and then he started documenting it in the Walbins project. So that's a cool story, right? But what do you actually mean by executables that are part of an operating system that can be supported in an attack? What exactly are they? And this is where we get into the explain like I'm five situation, because if I can't explain it properly to a five-year-old, then I'm not doing my job very well. So here to help me explain is everybody's favorite paperclip, Clippy. Wait a minute. I don't own the rights to Clippy. I might get in trouble. So here's Clipper to explain. Um, I actually tried a whole bunch of ways to get AI to generate some version of a knockoff Clippy for me, and it didn't work out very well. It was really scary. Um, I'll post a couple of those really creepy examples later on. But so here's Clipper to explain. Yes, I made them in MS Paint, and it was fun. So here's Clipper. He is very helpful. He's built into your operating system. He's here to help you with all your needs. You can trust him because he was there with the system. Security knows him. And then, unfortunately, also, this malware knows that he's a thing. But if the malware executes, then security will most likely catch on to him. So what's malware to do? Hey, Clipper, will you help me? Uh, I'm, I'm just a normal process. And it's not Clipper's, like it's not his prerogative to decide what's normal or what's not. He's just doing what's being asked of him. So he's here to help with all the technical needs. So by executing through this legitimate process, he kind of avoids detection. And I put the asterisks there because there are security tools out there that can detect this sort of stuff. So I'm not saying like if you instantly work through a lull bins, you won't be detected. but. Security is like, huh, that's weird, but it's Clipper, so that's kind of fine. Um, and then the malware is able to execute. 
So I know that was a very, very basic idea of it, but again, I don't know what level we're working with here. Some people might have never heard of a law bin before, but the same goes for GTFO bins and law bins. It's all the same concept. It's just depending on which operating system you're working through. So again, they have legitimate libraries. I included a couple screenshots, just like trying to like familiarize with what we might be working with. So these programs have legitimate uses like for the operating support. So you can't just shut them off. Um, instead of packaging everything together, some malware providers like to use these. So it makes their malware smaller and it makes it a little bit easier to smuggle in. So instead of like, hey, I'll do a, like a phishing campaign, you know, if they manage to get into a system, then they might use something else to call their malware in. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of different ways that you can go about this. The lists are quite long now in the projects, uh, so it's kind of it's kind of difficult to stay up to date. But that's why you know, thank you to the Advarmos of the world who keep these projects up to date. So. We're going to clarify what it is because there's a lot of misconceptions about what actually is a wall bin. Um, and it's starting to expand a little bit, but traditionally it was a signed file or binary native to the operating system or could be downloaded from the official site. So what I mean by that is uh, how many of you guys are familiar with like Microsoft Suite where it might have like a, a PS exec or something like that? Sometimes that's not natively on operating systems. Sometimes you have to download that separately and bring it in. Um, I know a lot of corporations who do that, they kind of install more of a strict operating system without all the fancy developer tools and then people download them later anyways. So that was the original intent. And then they have to have an unexpected functionality. So when you think about that, if I do a net use to map a network drive, that's what it's used for, so that's not a wall bin. But if I use like MSHTA, which is used to service HT, HTA files, but it can also download a remote payload, that's considered a wall bin because it's not natively used to download payloads. Um, the functionality is also kind of like focused on what threat actors and red teams can use. So if it's something that like, you know, you're not going to see a threat actor use a particular wall bin for a reason, then it's not technically a wall bin. But interesting functions by definition can be executing code, different file operations such as read, write, execute, um, upload, download, that sort of stuff. So we're going to check out these sites really quick because sometimes it helps to see them rather than me just talk about them. So please bear with the transition really quick. My mouse fell asleep. So, this is the Lawbus project, and it's actually going to be kind of difficult for me to navigate from here. But, so each of these is a binary that you can find on Windows. We might just stick with Lawbins for now because Windows is most common. Um, but when you go in, you see all these different functions, so what it can be used for. Some of them have many functions. Um, those are ones you want to be a little bit more careful about. And then each of these is also mapped to MITRE ATT&CK. So I know a lot of management, a lot of compliance groups, audit, they'd like to see some sort of framework when it comes to this sort of stuff. So if we just, uh, what's one of my favorite ones? Mm. Let's just go to control.exe. So when you go into each of these, it gives you a definition of what it is, where it can be found, different resources from like the researchers on how it's been abused. And then there's also these things called detections and sigma rules. Um, sometimes you'll see stuff like elastic. It's all just different detections that the blue team uses to you know, get rid of this stuff. So. This is the actual wall bins, aka the unexpected functionality. So it can be used to execute alternative data streams. And this here is an example of it. So typically, if you see something like this in logs, where it's like control.exe, you typically see that as a standalone. But when it's paired with this sort of uh, like task file calling another binary, um, that's what the actual malicious execution of it is. So 
It can be used to ev evade defenses, to hide, you know, persistent mechanisms and stuff like that. I lost my name. So I'll show you GTF opens the same when it comes to Linux binaries. Um, you have the same situation where you have the binary that's already built into Linux, 7-zip, um, what it's meant to do, and then how you can abuse it. Here's lol bins, which is the Mac OS version. And this one's relatively brand new. So if you guys are like Mac users and you're really knowledgeable with the different Mac binaries, um, consider actually doing research and submitting it to the Orchard project because, like I said, it's brand new. Um, threat actors ha can compromise Macs. I know everybody likes to think that Mac OS is like super hard and secure, nobody can get past it, but they're slowly turning their attention to it. So this is, again, the, the Mac project. So why do threat actors use them? Why do red teamers use them? Well, they're kind of stealthy. And I mean, how many blue teamers out there actually know their environment to a T or know every single binary that exists on a system? And on top of all that, knows what that binary is supposed to look like in their logs. That's kind of a tall ask. So they like to use these built-in programs to carry out malicious stuff. Um, they take advantage of it by not having to package it in with their code, makes it a little bit more lightweight, makes it easier to abuse the system more or less. Um, and again, it makes it harder for security systems to detect them. And on top of it all, when it comes to like programs, it's really easy, like, okay, we don't want TeamViewer in our environment. We'll just block it. Well, you can't exactly block a cert util. You can't exactly block command. Like, you can't necessarily block all this sort of stuff so they know what's going to be there. If they can figure out what sort of operating system you're running, the tools are already there. So it makes it makes it really fun for them and makes it really terrible for the defenders. So how do they ID and exploit? How does a wall bin become a wall bin? Research. Lots and lots and lots of research. Um, so, like I said, fingerprinting an operating system gives them a leg up, and then all you have to do is kind of like look at the same sites. You know, they're not just for blue teamers. If they look at the website and are like, okay, well, I've never known, I didn't know that this binary existed, it's right then and there. So, I like this meme in particular. RDP isn't a wall bin, but it's sort of the same concept where blue teamers are looking for the bad stuff. Okay, like blue teamers are looking for a cobalt strike, they're looking for, you know, like a Bitcoin miner. They're not looking for RDP necessarily because RDP is used throughout your environment. I mean, even if you were like, hey, let's look up who's RDPing where. If you look up like rdpclip.exe, the amount of logs you're going to get back are going to be terrible. And obviously, you can kind of use context if you know your environment well enough. Like, okay, maybe a support desk technician should be using RDP but why is this marketing director? So again, it's not super straightforward when it comes to looking for this sort of stuff, but that's a kind of a good meme to like showcase you know, why it's so difficult. So let's look at an attack really quick. Um, I chose bit, bit admin because it's probably one that you guys should be aware of. Um, so it's a command line tool where you can download stuff, you can update jobs. And when I was first looking for this in our environment, I was like, okay, nobody should be using it. It's probably not that common. And lo and behold, people were using it. So what happens typically with a malicious actor is they will come up with some sort of drop file, like a bat file or a LMK file, which downloads another payload. And I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this text really well, but they use bits admin to transfer basically the payload out of this linked file to call a stager. And again, like we said with bits admin, that's kind of its purpose. So this one kind of starts falling into a little bit deeper of a definition of what a wall bin actually is. 
So, but bits admin, traditional software, you know, you can probably block typical stuff with like a proxy. Um, but how many of you guys are blocking like a command shell through your proxy? You know, you're probably using typical like Chrome or Firefox. You have your proxy blocks there, but not through command line. So, bits admin will call the malicious payload, it'll download stuff, and lo and behold, you have a whole bunch of badness. Um, and typically they'll use some sort of lull bin to either call an encryption process, which is what happens with uh, ransomware, is there is an encrypt DLL, which is another already built-in product in like Microsoft, but, or it could do a whole bunch of other badness, like this one calls Meterpreter, which if you guys aren't looking for Meterpreter, if you see something like that that's not in a Linux environment where you typically intend to see it, like, you know, your red team using it, then uh, that's that's another one you want to block. So this all sounds terrible for the blue team. What can we do? Um, baseline, figure out what's normal in your environment. There was a lot of lull bins. There are a lot of GTFO bins. There are a lot of lull bins listed on that website. It's going to take a while, but what you could do is if you have any sort of Windows process logs, if you have an EDR system, if you have any of that stuff, just start throwing them in and figure out which ones you never see. And if you never see them, then just write a detection like, hey, this should never happen in our environment. Um, you're going to hit a lot of work, unfortunately. Um, like I said, there's, there's processes that get called all the time. There are a lot of executables that get used all the time. Um, if you want to, you can probably start carving those out by, okay, our developers are allowed to use that. Our system engineers are allowed to use that. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, but trust me, it's worth it in the long run. Um, and then if you don't know, figure out what the existing features are with a product. So like, let's just say um, XWizard. So XWizard has a whole bunch of different products uh, or different features you can run, like different flags. Um, maybe it's normal to see a, a WAC S or a WAC F, or I'm just making these off the top of my head. You'll have to go and look at the official Microsoft documentation. And that's my face when I look at the official Microsoft documentation. So I'm, I apologize right now, then and there. But so if you see stuff that's typically normal, like, it, okay, it typically runs in this fashion. It's a scripted job that we can whitelist. If it's anything else, then that might be bad. So this is the official documentation, and this is just a screenshot of it, and this is just the server bits admin. So there is a separate one, and I know I, I probably you guys want me to focus on some GTFO bins and stuff like that. I'll get into that, but I figure most of you guys are familiar with Windows environments. They're kind of the more common corporate environment, so that's why I'm sticking with this one for now. Um, so you can compare the official documentation to the Lawless project. Um, like I said, if you're familiar with the typical use on a server, then go into it and figure out, okay, this stuff isn't typical, this stuff isn't what we will see, and why do extra work when you don't have to? There's already Sigma rules written. If you guys have a detection engineering team or anybody who works with your SIM team, um, point them to that. that. It still might require some tuning but I wanna sort of walk through a Sigma rule with you guys too. So, like I said, don't <laughs> reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. And this one is going to be really difficult to see. So I'm going to kinda try to point my way through it. I'll talk a little bit louder so you guys can see it. So this is for a bits admin download. Um, as you can see, there's different tags and there's different references. You'll find like a lot of re researchers will be reoccurring in Sigma. Sigma is kind of the detection style that's ag like that's vendor agnostic. So a lot of people now are writing their rules in Sigma, so that way they can put them into some kind of detection as code. So that way, if you transition sim vendors, I know if you guys attended the first presentation on track one, he was talking about the headache of this too, is every vendor seems to have their own proprietary data structure and different way of doing detection. So a lot of people are now formatting in Sigma as a way to kind of baseline this across the industry. So log sources, um, process creation in Windows, a lot of people typically have these kind of Windows logs. Um, if you don't, then 
we probably are dealing more with a PDR. There are ways to translate these rules, um, but this one's just process create in Windows. So with the detection, it's working off of this admin as the image. So obviously, this admin.exe, if you see that run, okay, that's the first condition. And then we'll go to suspicious flags, which are if you see a command line with transfer in it, okay, that's a little shady. You might have a service account that runs a transfer process. That might be normal. Okay, you could probably avoid this the service account that's doing it. But that's one suspicious condition. Other suspicious conditions might be if you see create and add file in the same command line. So that's another suspicious flag. And then there's an HTTP flag in here too, which is obviously okay. If you're transferring something from the web, that's probably shady. So with all these different things, there's one more two where it's copy this admin.exe. So you might actually see somebody copy this particular executable. You've seen a lot with um, different threat actors where they'll copy these legit binaries to a different location and rename them to try to mask what they're doing. So if you see copy that's admin too, that's another, you know, okay, somebody's trying to hide their activity. Like I might copy this admin into a different folder and rename it penguin.exe. And then all of a sudden your blue teamers are going, what's penguin transferring? So, but after all that, there's conditions. So like it might be like, okay, if the first one is this admin and this particular flag, then over. So you don't have to match all of these. You can play around with the conditional language. And then of course, there's different fields that are needed. Um, these are just to kind of help you with your data missionaries. So you might have command line, or you might have process command line, or you might have parent command line. So that's all stuff that you're gonna have to figure out for your environment. Um, and then you can see whether or not like people have seen a ton of false positives in or not in this environment, um, and what severity level they run. So if you're going to see some rules where they're like, hey, we didn't see any false positives, but you might see false positives if. So in this case, they assume that you don't use this admin a lot, but if you do, hey, you're going to see false positives. So that's kind of a walkthrough of Sigma. If you guys aren't familiar with Sigma, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, some of like my favorite researchers like Florian Roth and Mr. Dox, they all contribute to this and they contribute to the law of us project. So it's people who are working with the, hey, I've identified this as malicious, but also here's a rule. So I, I trust these guys a lot. All right, more on to what the blue teamers can do. So I know we talked about like, you know, detections, but that all seems kind of like passive, like, okay, so now we're gonna be stuck dealing with a, hey, an alert went off, now we're in firefighting mode and we have to battle it out. So is there anything we can do to actually prevent this sort of stuff? So my recommendations are to reduce the chances of an admin level run, because a lot of these have to deal with, like a lot of these are successful because people have local admin. and. And this is gonna make a lot of people mad, but your users do not have to be local admin. They don't. Like I know a lot of people say they, they have to be, a lot of people say they have to be sudoers users. They don't. And they don't need permissions to write or execute out of system 32 necessarily. They might need, they probably need read access. Read access has to be a thing in system 32, but they don't need higher rights. Um, so like I said, try to like restrict those level permissions or even when it comes to service accounts, your service account for your application does not need to be domain admin. Asterisk there because there are a couple that legitimately do. Um, I have seen quite a few like vulnerability scanners if they don't have domain admin, they kind of like, you know, they don't run properly. But a lot of like developers, they say their, their system, their application has to be domain admin and that's just poor coding. So if you can reduce any of that sort of stuff, um, if you can use like a, like a PAM, like a credential, a higher elevation credential type system, um, I, I understand that not everybody has the budget in the world to pull that sort of stuff off, but these are just little things you can do. Um, utilize a layered defense, think outside the box. So like I said, when it came to like, hey, you might block, block at the proxy so your users can't go to malicious sites. 
Um, you might do a block where like, hey, they can't go to like a mega.io to download files and stuff like that. But also make sure that you're blocking um, like PowerShell. Like PowerShell shouldn't go to that. That might bypass your proxy protections. So there's always like a couple ways to get through detections like that. Um, a couple ways to get through preventions too. So of course, you know, if you can do that sort of defense and then make sure that users aren't admin and then have antivirus or an EDR on top of it, use a layered defense. Um, if you can, regular perform purple team assessments. Um, that's one of my favorite things to do as part of my job is I like to be a blue teamer and then I also like to say like, okay, well, we, we just wrote this rule. How do I get by it? You know, I like, to, I like to play that angle a lot, is I like to have fun defeating our own defenses. So if you can perform purple team activities, if you can set the, the time aside for it, really recommend doing it. And then of course, you know, like educate users. I mean, we all know that users are kind of a thorn in our side, but that's part of the business. So if you can train them to do like, you know, regular like phishing activities or understand what's weird, um, if all of a sudden they see a blip of a black box and like they're like, okay, well that was, kind of weird after I clicked on this link on this website, you know, I train them to recognize that and definitely don't shame them for reporting. Uh, we, we have a really good system in place where you, we don't punish people for reporting anything that might be weird. Um, we'd rather have people be safe rather than sorry. And we all know it's going to be a real balance and a real fight between security and business. So like I said, it's not like you can just block everything uh, as much as we would like to. Oh wait, there's more. <laughs> How many of you guys have heard of wall drivers? That's another project that's coming off. So uh, living off the land drivers, it's a project trying to detail malicious drivers. I don't know, I'll go into a real world example of malicious drivers, but yeah, so if you wanna check out another project that's coming down the pipeline, uh, they're tracking anything that has like an outstanding vulnerability um, there's been a couple high profile attacks that come off of malicious drivers. Well, not even malicious drivers. They're just regular drivers that somebody found a way to exploit them. So now we're getting to the, some of the most commonly abused ones. And these are the ones that I think you guys should know. Obviously, it's my opinion. Some people might think there are better ones. And there's a couple on here that are, I hesitate to call them wall bins, but other people have called them wall bins. PowerShell is that one. So PowerShell, it's a command line tool. It's a scripting tool. It's designed to be a scripting tool. It's a system administration tool, but it's so heavily abused that people are calling it a wall bin. I disagree, but I'm saying it anyways. If you can restrict PowerShell users, please do. If you can restrict people from elevating PowerShell command prompts, please do. I understand PowerShell has a lot of uses, um, maybe you don't necessarily have the tools in place to manage your systems without the use of PowerShell, um, but make sure you recognize what is normal for PowerShell and make sure you recognize which users are using it and what they're using it for. Um, but here's a couple other ones. Um, MSHTA is actually becoming a really popular one because it serves up HTML applications. So what a lot of users will see is when they click an HTA file, it opens what looks like Microsoft, and it looks like it's a website, but a lot of times it's actually just a, you know, it's a disguise, so they'll have you click something and they'll start downloading a package, but that package has already been in there, embedded in the HTA file, which I know it sounds kind of like convoluted and stuff, but that's like a process that's really abused now by threat actors. So if you see LNK to HTA files, uh, that's, definitely a sign that you should probably isolate that system. Um, so a couple other ones, cert util, obviously if you don't have a means to serve up your certificates or handle them, things might get really bad. Um, people have used that to download other binaries. Um, Bitsadmin, which we talked about. Uh, run DLL32 is another interesting one. I don't know how familiar you guys are with like lower layer DLLs but they're basically built-in applications that help other applications run. And run DLL32 serves up those DLLs. So it's all real, it gets really convoluted and lower level stuff, but this is one where if you see run DLL servicing up like an IP address, that's not right. 
If you see it servicing up a whole bunch of different DLLs that might not be what you want to see, like if you see like crypt32.dll and stuff that's running a lot, um, unless you have a use for it, like you purposely have people who use it to encrypt files and stuff like that, uh, you might want to check that sort of stuff out. So GTFO bins, there was a lot of these too, and I figured most people probably aren't super familiar with everything Linux. Um, so chmod is at the top, not just because it's in alphabetical order, but because it's really popular with people. Um, chmod can change the permission levels. So like, let's just say if you are just a lowly level user, but you need to have higher elevations to view a file, like somebody with a higher elevation can use C chmod to change the file permissions. Um, but we see that a lot when it comes to people changing like executable rights and stuff too. So if I was a bad guy, I might bring in a file called badfile.exe.txt. But on a Linux system, I might need to use chmod to change that to just an executable file to get my malware to run. So making it something benign will get it through all the filters, but then I'll change it to run my code. Um, Crontab, and I don't know if I have time to go through all these, but Crontab you see a lot when it comes to scheduling jobs. Um, this is a really popular persistence mechanism. So I would check for this and go, okay, like if it's a normal, you know, service account where we have a job that runs every night and it's a batch file job for finance. Okay, that's normal. But what is this weird job that's running every 10 minutes that's adding a user into the sudoers file or something of that sort? That might be a little bit something that uh, seems a bit fishy. So crontab's another one. Um, curl and wget, which also can be used on Windows, and there's a whole bunch of aliases too, so you might see it as um, iwr, which is invoke web requests. So Unfortunately, you can rename these files too, but this will be used to pull data. So I could use, if I'm on a, my laptop and I use curl to go to a server, I can pull files that way. But people can also use that to pull stuff from the internet. So if I was like curl, github, pull a malicious file, I can use it that way too. So you wanna know who's grabbing what with curl or wget. Um, some other ones that are really fun, um, GIMP, I know everybody thinks of that as just like a photo editing service, but you can do a lot with it, um, including like manipulating like data, so that one I thought was fun to mention. And the same with Lua, um, Lua loads and executes Lua programs, um, but it can be used to execute a whole bunch of other stuff too. I gotta speed up a little bit. Um, so, low bins going in the Mac. So, um, CSR util, which is uh, can configure netboot and authenticated root services. So, you probably don't want any users touching that. Um, that's probably one to flag. Like I said, I don't have a ton of familiarity with Mac, but I know a lot of you out there do, so you probably can pick up really quick what I'm laying down. Um, ditto, Pokemon. Um, but actual ditto is used to copy files, so it's kind of, you know, another like X copy or, you know, you can use that to, you know, snag files maybe of different permission levels. Um, some of my actual playing around with is it, it preserves the file attributes, which is kind of cool. Um, so I think there'll be probably a bit more research on the how to abuse that in the near future. Um, NSCurl is like curl and wget, which we just went over. Um, and then TCLSH, which is their, their shell version. Um, so you can load different plugins and frameworks without actually requiring signed code, which is interesting to me because I know Apple is typically really secure with their need for signatures. Um, so you can disable the entitlement and then you can load stuff without actually requiring that sign, um, which is pretty cool. But I know I've uh, been really excited to talk about this one. So breaking news, how many of you guys are familiar with Electron apps? 
which are like Slack and Teams and all that sort of stuff. Okay, they're, they're wall bins now, but more importantly, Microsoft Edge WebView 2, which helps support these apps, that's actually what's vulnerable. Um, Mr. Docs actually, he's a well-known researcher, he submitted Teams and Edge to the Walbins project recently. If you go on the GitHub, you see it pending right now. I imagine it'll be public soon. Um, but when it came to the actual MS Web View, he, we were talking about it in a Discord channel, and there's less than 300 users in this Discord channel. So like I said, you guys are kind of some of the first to know. Um, it's not well known, and he hasn't exactly said if he's going to submit this one or not which can be a little bit shady. But basically what Web, Web Edge View does is it helps service up um, your apps, so your Electron apps, your CSE, and your JavaScript, and all that sort of stuff. So it's embedded web technologies. But what you can do is you can use it to download stuff. So remember my example where I was like, hey, malicious.file.exe.txt? So you can use Web View on launch. If I was like writing a piece of malware, if it launched Microsoft Edge, it'll instantly start a download. And if you use a file extension like .exe.txt, it'll get past smart screen, which is kind of scary. So if I was a bad actor writing a piece of code and I was like, okay, well, we're gonna use WebView to go and pull a file from my GitHub called badcode.exe.txt. And once that's downloaded, my Malware is going to strip the TXT and execute that EXE binary now. So it's really cool, it's really interesting, and a lot of apps are starting to use this WebView too. So you might want to start vetting this sort of stuff. You might want to check out right now which of your Electron apps are normal. So what you want to look for is like, for example, if, if we use Teams or if we use Slack, I want to go in my logs and see what a typical Slack launch looks like. I want to look and see what a typical Teams launch looks like. I want to see what a typical web view looks like. If you start seeing HTTP requests to sites that you don't typically see, such as GitHub or Mega or any of that sort of stuff, uh, that's a red flag. Like I said, I don't know how widely used this is. Researchers have just kind of come across it. So, yay okay, fun. Uh, I, I want to throw a couple examples of a couple high profile hacks. I know I'm running out of time, but so there are so many I could think of, but I wanted to keep it to date. And this just came out a couple weeks ago. CISA put out a report for it on Vote Typhoon, which is a Chinese based threat actor. And what was interesting about this one is they relied almost exclusively on living off the land techniques and hands-on keyboard. So a lot of like, you know, QBots of the world, they'll spam the world and they'll use an automated fashion. And you can pick out those patterns and they don't change them that often. But with hands-on stuff, it's a little bit harder to see because everybody's gonna use stuff a little bit differently. So they used um, Run DLL 32, which I mentioned. Um, they use that to decode and dump LSAS, and if you don't have a detection on LSAS getting dumped, then uh, that's kind of a problem. Well, I know a lot of EDRs will alert on it now, but then they used WMIC, which is another built-in process um, to remotely create a domain controller installed media, and then they'll locally dump all that sort of stuff. But again, you see NTDSUtil, that's another built-in program. You see RunDL32, that's a built-in program. You can't really block this stuff. You just gotta know what's abnormal. And I wanna mention Spyboy because this is another one, and I don't know if I, I'd really 100% consider this a wall bin, but it could be. So there was a threat actor recently called Spyboy who was recently advertising a tool called Terminator, which will turn off get past any antivirus EDR. And they listed like CrowdStrike and Defender and Semantic and all the big ones. And they, and they were charging like 300 to 3,000. So we all kind of were like, that's not, that's not a thing. And it wasn't. So it's an actual like bring your own, bring your own vulnerable driver attack. So the only reason I'm mentioning this is because there is the wall drivers now. 
And technically, the Zemna anti-malware driver that he brought in could be considered a wall bin based on if you have that driver already installed. So what happens is this driver is already installed. There's a POC code for CB2021, something like that. So what that does is he uses that POC code to hook into this limit, legitimate driver, which kills off the user processes. So again, it could be a wall bin if you're running this already vulnerable driver. Um, so you, if it, I don't know if any of you guys are running this, but make sure you check that out. Um, bring your own vulnerable driver attacks are, like, like I said, legitimate drivers signed with valid certificates. Um, but because drivers can run with kernel level permissions, they, they can kill off EDRs and stuff like that. So it's, it's legit, but not legit. It's not a big thing I think you guys should worry about, especially if you don't have local admin rights for your users, because it has to be run in admin mode and you have to accept the UAC. So I, I'd imagine seeing this with insiders maybe. But so wrapping up, too long, didn't listen. What, what did we learn? Um, understanding the OS architecture is extremely important for understanding living off the land sort of techniques, whether it's Windows or Linux or Mac. Um, disabling critical services, unfortunately, as security professionals, our biggest protection go-to is let's just block it. Let's just turn it off. And we can't always do that. So detection engineering and baselining are your friends. Um, support the projects or at least be familiar with them. Obviously, more stars, more attractions, more people who take an interest in this sort of stuff. We're going to find more wall bins. We're going to find more techniques before the bad guys do. We're going to develop the detections first. And then just, like I said, always check them for, for regular updates. So I know I kind of like squirrel brain talked really fast. Um, use simple OSINT if you want to add me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on Discord and you can figure out my username because I have posted a picture of the same shirt that I'm wearing now. I'm sorry for being vague, but that's just kind of the paranoid cybersecurity professional in me. So any questions? No? I don't have a funny joke. I didn't drink before this. Thank you.